I can expect People are medicine, and it's an idea that I've been playing with the, sort of for a while now because I help my patients with certain things, but if I tell you that the stories that they've shared with me, the energy that they've stay, shared with me, my patients are my medicine. Um, and it's a reciprocal thing. Obviously, the nature of my practice is it's a formal setting. I've got a plinth, someone pulls in a little yellow file, you know, they lie on the plinth. But you can go for a dinner and a friend heals you. You can be in a meeting and a colleague heals you. You can have an interaction with a cashier and they heal you. So people are medicine. And I think if people just realize that we're here, we're here to fix one another, your, your life becomes, you know, it's on a dimension that is just so satisfying. Welcome to the 100th episode of the Reinvent Health Podcast. For the next hour, I get to chat with functional and integrative physiotherapist Laurel Doman about what it takes to become more self-aware and create the best version of yourself possible. So Laurel Doman, thank you so much for joining me today on the Reinvent Health Podcast. Um, today we are talking about um, a topic that I'm passionate about, and I know that you certainly are. Uh, so I can't wait to to surprise our listeners with something that they didn't see coming. But before we get started, would you let let, let us know, you know what is what is it that you do? Who are you in your day job before we go down the rabbit hole? Yes, of course, Nikki. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to do the journey with you, and um, I know that we share or that a lot of our visions are aligned and I'm very excited yeah possibly just to see where this journey takes us and share with the listeners some listeners some new good information um so Laurel Doman is my name and I'm a physiotherapist practicing in Bryanston um I I think it's important to kind of share a little bit of um, my background and the nature of my practice so physiotherapy is obviously my main hustle and I've got a postgraduate in orthopedics, so that's knee pain, neck pain, you know, back pain. I think the general things that people associate with physiotherapy. But then the additional practices that I've added are applied kinesiology and craniosacral therapy, visceral manipulation, which is just a fancy word for treating into the organs. And the branch of medicine that I work in is functional and integrative medicine, um, I think you're pretty familiar with that space, but just for the listeners' sake, I always suggest that the question that we ask in functional and integrative medicine is what, I mean, is why rather than what. So not what diagnosis and what medication, but why is your body doing what it does? So it demands a very much more holistic approach to health and wellness um, rather than symptom management and just pharmaceutical intervention, getting to the root cause of why your body is reacting the way that it is. So I think that's what trademarks the very holistic nature of my physiotherapy practice in particular. Yeah. And just from my personal experience, I, I mean, I've been to many physiotherapists post-injury um, throughout my life and I've had plenty injuries. And, you know, I think your approach, what really stood out for me was you're just not the normal physiotherapist. So when you go to someone like yourself, because you have a shoulder pain or a knee pain, you assume they're going to be applying therapy to that specific area of your body. And what was a surprise, a, a fantastic surprise to me was that there was so much more to it. And I can honestly say from all the therapies or the physical therapies that I've experienced, what I've experienced with you is a real solid transformation. I mean, I don't suffer from those problems anymore um, in the way that I used to. So something definitely shifted and your approach is, is, is incredibly unique. So, you know, you went and you studied and you, you you did all your training and you started working with people, but what shifted you into asking the question, why? Why are we suffering and how do we approach this person and what they're going through in a different way? What was that shift for you? Nikki, I think there's a, a, there's a couple of layers to that question, but I'll ask, uh, I mean, I'll answer you know, a couple of things that come to mind and things that I often speak about. So one thing that I always say, when mm. you're in healthcare, everyone wants to know that you're Florence Nightingale. So I had so many patients sort of say to me, but do you love your job? And I just said, yes, but 
I, I like to reflect what exactly about my job is it that I like? Because do I like massaging people's necks or their backs or working into their organs? The actual manual labor part of my job is not necessarily my passion. But what I am passionate about, the, the nature of my job that I enjoy is problem solving. So I read a quote once that said, people don't care about your business. They care about their problems. Solve their, pro solve their problems and they'll support your business. And um, I, why I sort of brought up the Florence Nightingale, I don't like thinking of healthcare as a business, but obviously the financial transaction is really just a formality. You know, I've got overheads to cover. I have to pay for the square meterage that I occupy. But the true passion in my in my um, practice is, as I said, the problem solving nature of it. The reason why I had to expand my studies is because I found that just that which you get undergrad is not necessarily enough to facilitate the change that people need. So physiotherapy, I once had a patient come to see me and she said, I'm here under duress because I, I don't think there's a figure in Joburg that I haven't seen. And she said, it's, it's, like, it's a profession that's stuck in the dark ages. She's like, every single person has been doing the same thing for me for the last 20 years to no avail. And that is my food. When someone comes to me and says, I have been everywhere and nothing has helped then I'm like, great, challenge accepted. And I think um, I think it's not necessarily a, a scope of practice problem because I think that there's a lot of good information available. But I think it's the curiosity, the curiosity post-grad. What I always say is, is that people need to use their university degree not as – um, the full parameter of what they're going to be able to do, but it's actually the foundation from which you need to do your own research. If you don't do that, you've failed as a scholar. So although physiotherapy gave me the license and the curiosity, everything that I have learned subsequently has been from patients. And that is actually the other point that I want to make. A big change um, came about in my practice when I stopped thinking that I needed to impose my clinical knowledge on someone and I actually became curious because I find that the patient is the most valuable resource and I went from thinking that I need to fix someone to asking the body what it needs from me so I always joke and say I offer it my menu and then I say what would you like chicken or beef you know and my sensitivity in communicating with patients' bodies transformed as well. And I had to be brave enough to actually react on that feedback too, because I, for example, when you ask that question, I was surprised at how chatty the body is. And then all of a sudden I had to act on it. So if I asked the body, what would you like from me? And I knew the patient was there for their lower back, but the body suggested I work into their feet. I had to be brave enough to pick up on that cue and then do it, you know? So, um, yeah, it was a multi-layered answer there, but it wasn't necessarily one thing, but definitely a curiosity, definitely using the patient as your main resource, um, resource, definitely using my university degree as a platform from which to use my own and uh, do my own research, and then just remaining curious. If something doesn't work, then you have to change it, you know. So I could sort of say, come back Monday, Thursday for the rest of your life. Let me put two needles in a hot pack and rub your back you know, but it's not going anywhere. Um, I think the functional and integrative medicine, sorry, I'm chatting a lot now, but the functional and integrative medicine also changed my idea because there's a lot that um, pharmaceutical medicine wants to suggest is incurable, like autoimmune conditions, like thyroid problems, you know, that sort of thing. The functional integrative medicine, as well as lifestyle medicine, has debunked that statement, you know, and I think pharmaceutical medicine satisfied when a symptom is managed I don't want to a successful intervention to me is not how much medication someone is on it's rather how empowered they are to take care of their own health and how much medication they're off so I'm just curious how long did it take you to get to that point where you were you felt okay I'm going to just trust this body talking to me and really go off the beaten path of what you were trained to do how long into your practice did it take for that to happen um, Nikki, first of all, I don't think that journey is finished, <laughs> you know, so I'm learning all the time, but I can certainly recognize pertinent turning points, you know, in the process. So I think the benefit was of the nature of my practice was that I actually started with apl applied kinesiology. So the applied kinesiology I actually ended up doing while I was at school and I completed the applied kinesiology in my matric year. 
So then I went into university with that foundation already. And I think the most fundamental thing that the applied kinesiology taught me um, was, first of all, a way to communicate with the body. So using the, the an integrity test to direct your treatment. Um, so that already suggested communication with the body. And I already had that as a foundation. And then the other thing that the applied kinesiology made me curious about was specifically gut health. So the woman that I learned with was was very passionate about gut health and that was I mean she was way ahead of her time that was she started 30 years ago already you know so I already had that curiosity then I after qualifying I did my my postgrad in the orthopedic manual therapy so that was very conventional physiotherapy but it gave me a very good um, foundation for sports injuries vocational injuries you know how the body works um, biomechanically then I added the craniosacral therapy, which is actually an osteopath practice. And that, once again, fed into the subtle nature of the body, you know, the way the body communicates. And that cultivated sensitivity towards that. Um, but I was very, very careful to keep my practices in very separate boxes. Then with the visceral manipulation, uh, um, you know, I sort of bumped into a technique called listening. And then I thought, well, if I can listen to organs, I could probably listen to anything else in the body, you know. So I used that then took it, you know, that that then transformed my practice to sort of go, well, you know, let me, as I say, not reserve um, my listening techniques or my communication techniques techniques to one specific practice and then I broke down all the walls between everything you know and that was really liberating but prior to the visceral manipulation course I'd already experienced I always say the body speaks to me in images and it speaks to me in very abstract images and although I find myself to be very literal and logical this was by all for all intents and purposes it was magical you know I was getting information from the body that the patient hadn't communicated with me. But what I always say is when I work with someone, I ask, let me hear what they mean and not what they say, you know, and let me hear what they feel and not what they, because often healthcare relies only on a vocabulary and you're so limited with a vocabulary because not everyone is well-versed. Not everyone has the capacity to put what they're feeling into words. Culturally, possibly, it's to, to speak about certain things, you know. So I'd already developed a sensitivity for what's going on behind the scenes and that which a patient, you know, couldn't necessarily communicate. But as I say, it's actually, it wasn't one, one specific moment where I was like, cool, now, you know, all inhibition is lost and I'm going to just venture into uncharted territory. There were certain things that unfolded. And it's almost as though... I always say that the person who has healed the most through the work that I do is me. It's almost as though when you reach a certain, a certain maturity and a certain honesty with yourself, you're trusted with more power. <laughs> so as I've matured, as I have refined my sense of responsibility towards patients, bodies have revealed more to me. And that's why I say all I said here is I'm excited for what the future holds because I certainly don't think you know, where I am now that the journey is finished. I'm probably just starting with. Oh, far from it. Far from it. Um, so what comes to mind is, and I've always, you know, for, my, for myself, when I realized I didn't have to have all the answers, that the answers were actually sitting with the person you are helping to heal themselves that's when everything changes and it's it's a complete I, I suppose you could say ego dissolution because you realize you're just there to facilitate somebody else's wisdom absolutely, it's such a absolutely. freeing experience so what I always say is I when I say to patients when they oh wow it's so amazing what you've done men if I knew where that magic came from I would have taken all the glory but I'm surprised and the patient is surprised but what I always say yeah. to the patients is I'm a glorified translator. So I communicate yeah. with you in words what your body gives me. And it's a pleasure and a privilege. And so I always use the analogy of I'm really just a tube through which that light shines. It's my yeah. responsibility to maintain the integrity of the tube. But the quality of the light, I don't know where it comes from. And it definitely is very subtle dance between patient and practitioner. Yes, yes. No, I, I, I really resonate with that. And I mean, I'm living proof of what you 
do and it, it never fails to amaze me how how incredible that journey is so we could go on like this for hours and go down that rabbit hole but what we really Yeah, I know, right? But what we're really here to do to to, uh, to talk about today, when you when you came back to me with a topic, um, I was very excited, and that topic is what fuels your fire. And I'll give you a little bit of information as to where you know where the topic came from. So it was an observation in my clinical practice that the exact same practice or principle was facilitating health in one patient, and illness and an imbalance Right. in another. So the same habit, but with a different outcome. I think this question is relevant for the person that is doing all the right things. So what the right things, uh, you know, that's different to different people, but I'll give a couple of examples. So you're eating enough protein, you're getting enough fiber, you're exercising, you're meditating, Mm. you're doing cold plunges, you're doing dry brushing, blah, blah, blah. But you're not Yeah. really experiencing that glow that everyone is raving about on Instagram. So Yeah. right practice, you know, but not necessarily achieving the desired outcome or right practice, right habits, and you remain ill. Yeah. So that's what that was what sparked off, you know, the question of what it is that fuels your fire. So Sure. I acknowledge that the wellness space is very tricky to navigate because I think if you ask anyone, are they interested in wellness, everyone is going to say yes. But it's hard to know where to start because, you know, we're so flooded with information. What is clickbait? What is a sales pitch? And what is actually useful information, you know, that you can apply to your own life to improve your 24 hours? I think on that note, there isn't really a one size fits all. I think everyone secretly hopes that there's the silver bullet that's going to fix all our problems and probably more important, keep our problems fixed. Um, it's like we hope to pack a little a suitcase, hop on a habit airplane and then arrive at happiness destination and then we stay there permanently. So um, that was I wanted to, you know, I wanted to unpack a little bit of those dynamics and, you know, just help patients navigate um, or help listeners navigate the wellness space. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you really are spot on there because, I mean, the audience listening to this podcast are very interested in wellness, or at least I hope they are, and most of them have tried everything, you know. We've we've all tried all sorts of diets and, yes, the cold plungers and the, the yoga and every supplement and, you know, neuropeptide on the market, but most people aren't recovering, they're not happy, they're not getting better. because something's missing something's missing so let's let's dig into your experience i mean you must see people like this on a i know i do but you you must see people on a daily basis who just aren't getting there no matter what what is the profile of this kind of person and it's not lack of trying from their side you know if we could sort of say oh well it was lack yeah of trying you know then it then the 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 ball rests 100% in the court of the patient but This Sure. question really was born from the, that observation of everyone's doing exactly what they should, but they're not getting better. Nikki, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, um, you know, where it sort of came from. Um, I think, first of all, as I said, let me just say what I want to achieve with today's talk. I want to equip listeners with a, with an approach to wellness. I'm not here to recommend any specific habit. We are flooded with habits. You know, we're bombarded with information. There's a thousand recommendations, whether you want them or not, they, you know, being they being thrown at you on Instagram, on Facebook, Sure. podcasts, various platforms. Um, I'm going to quote a friend here. I laughed. He said, you know, once you've implemented all the practice that Instagram suggests, it's four o'clock in the afternoon and you haven't left the house, you know. Mm, So mm. I'm not here to recommend any more habits. What I want to what I want to um, suggest is an approach to health and wellness. Um, I'm going to go back to the nature of my practice here a little bit, um, so that listeners can understand where this question came from. So I have three pillars in my practice. So the three pillars in my practice are inflammation, stress management, and the pillar that gave rise today's to today's talk is rigidity. I use the word pillar um, suggesting or because I believe, you know, they they sort of it's scaffolding that keeps the roof of wellness up. 
But Pillar also suggests that they're standalone and they aren't really standalone. They do exist on a continuum and each of these pillars influence one sure. another. I'm going I'm going to speak briefly about the first two two pillars because they were sort of my they were my initial pillars, and the rigidity pillar was a pillar that I added in at a later stage. So, inflammation being the first pillar, and the reason why it's the first pillar, it was also my own start into my own healthcare journey. So, when I look at inflammation, and I think you'll echo a lot of these sentiments, mm. it's the easiest to look at diet because yeah. it's foreign substances that you're introducing to the body they come into contact hopefully not directly but yeah. they come into contact with your immune system and um you know they sort of play out how your immune or your body responds yes. um to what it is you introduce to it the other thing about inflammation and diet is what i also always suggest is patients need to think of diet as software that they coding their cells Absolutely. with you know so depending on the influence the quality of the software that it is that you feeding your your system that will dictate um, how it responds, and that can either fuel inflammation or curb inflammation. So one pillar in my practice, inflammation, and I pr predominantly look at diet there. The next pillar that's in my practice is stress management. When I speak of stress, I don't mean emails and deadlines. Everyone has emails and deadlines, and I think there's a lot of informa or information supporting mm. the benefit of sure. acute stress, you know, and how that actually um, facilitates a better health outcome. So what I always suggest is that it's not becoming stressed, mm. it's staying stressed that is the problem. And when I look at stress, as I said, I don't look at emails and deadlines, I actually look at how your specific personality interacts with its environment. So from that perspective, the analogy that I use there, if I had to give two people a party to plan, one person is an introvert and the other is an extrovert, um, it will be the very best thing the extrovert has ever done and it will be the very worst thing that the introvert yeah. has done. So the party isn't the problem. It's the personality that will, that will dictate how – how stressful right. a certain situation is. There's certain practices that obviously influence both inflammation and stress. So these include the quality of sleep, the amount of exercise and the healing quality of exercise, yeah. the quality of your breath and breathing, gut health, toxin load, heavy metal exposure, genetics, and that sort of thing. But the pillar that I'd like to discuss today specifically is the rigidity pillar. So the effect that rigidity has on your health and wellness, and it's also what go gave rise to the question of what fuels your fire. For the, for the sake of the talk, I'm going to separate health and wellness because I find that yeah. health is usually something that can be objectively measured and it's medical yeah. investigations and work and that sort of thing. But yeah. wellness is a more subjective experience of health. So it's less rooted in science, but it depends on your experience of your life and your sense of purpose, your sense of connection, and that word wellness also changes multiple times in your life. You know, wellness looks different in your 20s versus your 40s or your 70s. It also changes if you're working or if you're retired, if you're in a relationship or if you're not in a relationship, whether you have children or not, whether you're living in the same town or you're traveling every other week, you know. So by virtue, we can therefore acknowledge that wellness and rigidity cannot coexist because the definition of wellness will change so often in your lifetime. Yeah, I've never thought of it in terms of rigidity and and wellness can't exist. And that actually makes all kinds of sense uh, because then we're not, you know, don't even calibrate to the environment or not able to be flexible with the environment. How do we, I mean, the, the, the body will push back against that. So, yeah, that's a really interesting observation and it's i i think i just want to add there you know i it was so nice for me people we have a lot of statements that we come together you know we go health and wellness and they're two very different things health very objective wellness very subjective so in terms of you know for example um just going back to that which we discussed about the patient being the most valuable source of information if i go in with all my objective measures of health i can turn around and say oh well this patient's definitely better but if the patient doesn't feel that i have not solved their problem and i have not done my job so 
you know, you that this is also where the ego of medicine falls short all the time. I look at the patient's blood work and I'm like, look, the inflammation is better, and this is better, and that is better. But the patient's yeah. like, but I, I feel like junk mm. all time you know and that's where I separated health and wellness because I realized I was falling short as a practitioner but when I looked at wellness I was like wellness is it's the ebb and flow of life and it's ever changing and therefore as I say by virtue wellness and rigidity cannot coexist so I will I'll tell you where the rigidity pillar originated um I always say that the benefit of my job is that I get to share in the collective because in essence, I conduct 10 interviews in a day. <laughs> and I'm also hugely passionate about the power of storytelling because I have seen the strength that is drawn from a shared experience. People have immense amount of capacity to cope with something if they just know someone else has been through it. And even more importantly, if someone else has been through it yeah. and they've survived it. So if someone else is surviving the same hardship as you, somehow you feel like you've got the capacity to get out of bed again. So my own journey into inflammation management, as I said, that was the first pillar that I established in the practice. That started over 12 years ago, and it, it came about as a result of my background in the applied kinesiology and the relevance of gut health. And it started as plant-based. You know, That was the information mm. that I had at the time. So although I've come a mm. long way since that, it definitely taught me the nutritional value of food mm. being plant-based. But because I was so enthusiastic about the results that I was getting, I was evan evangelical about, you know, food. So anyone who sat still long enough got fearful <laughs> about it. <laughs> and then I saw patients that were doing exactly what I was doing, and they had no change. They weren't a fraction better. Ah. In fact, that they were almost worse. Yeah. So there was... There was no change to conditions like thyroid function or body pain or autoimmune conditions. Mm. And those were things that I knew a whole food diet could improve. Sure. Around the same time, my mom and I, on a Saturday morning, found ourselves at the Rosebank rooftop market. And Clive Scott was there. He was apparently a South African actor. Yes. I didn't know that. <laughs> but he was doing palm reading. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and my mom said, go for a palm reading. And I was like, Psh please, a palm reading, get serious. But I thought, you know, it's Saturday. And I re at that stage, I reserved frivolity for Saturdays. So off I walked up to his table and I sat down and I gave him my hands. I can't remember the things that he told me. They were relevant, coincidentally. Yeah. But the one thing that he said was, your gut isn't happy. Wow. And I immediately got offensive and rambled off. I don't eat meat. I don't eat wheat. I don't eat sugar. I don't do dairy. I don't do caffeine. I don't drink alcohol. I intermittent fast. Oh, wow. And off I went on telling him all the practices that I do. And he looked at me and he said, but are you happy? Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was so it went on in my brain. Wow. Habits devoid of joy serve only as a never-ending to-do list. Ah. So everything that I rambled off to him about all the good practices that I was doing, the way that I the way that I was communicating that information to my body was this is just another thing for me to do. Mm. And there was no joy. It had become almost mechanical, mm. you know, that this is just who I am and this is what I do. And I was almost alienating myself. I'd fairly recently moved to Joburg from Pretoria. I never went to school in Joburg. So it was almost alienating me prematurely because no one wanted to invite me over. They were like, oh, Laurel, that weird vegan yogi chick that, you know, doesn't drink anything. Don't, why are we going to invite her to a braai? Because we don't know what to feed. It's no fun. <laughs> anyway, so that was where, you know, that was the first sort of inkling that rigidity possibly has an effect on your health. Um, Absolutely. What I, as I say, what I realized about clients who were doing the same and that remain ill, even when they implementing the best or let me put it in inverted commas they're doing all the right things that the amount of ought to yeah. got to should have must is sending nervous systems into overdrive so good habit bad yeah. fuel anyway so what i what i derived from that um as i said it wasn't the only thing but it was the start of implementing the rigidity um rigidity pillar in my practice what I derived from it is, is I've almost distilled the two most toxic fuels that can fuel your fire down to two things. And they're actually flip sides of the same coin. So, and that is perfectionism and control. 
we tend to be more sympathetic and almost admirable towards perfection. And we offer words of encouragement, like don't be so hard on yourself, but secretly everyone reveres perfectionism. And we tend to have more yeah. resentment towards control. So because what you associate with as a micromanaging boss or a helicopter parent. But let me tell you, perfectionism and control are the same thing. I always say that perfectionism is just control with a fancy hat on. The other thing that I want to discuss here about it is how different I've seen perfectionism look in different people. I think archetypally, what we tend to think perfectionism is and who personifies perfectionism, we think of a woman that's likely to win a beauty pageant. Mm -hmm. I have seen perfection be the reason for obesity, for lethargy, for incapacitation, for a full resignation of your personal power. So I think, you know, I just... I just want to broaden listeners' minds and also possibly create the, you know, create a little bit of sympathy, not for themselves, because people will tend to recognize perfectionism in themselves, but they'll criticize. I almost want to say they'll just look at someone else and go, well, get a grip or take responsibility or, um, sure. you know, just snap out of it or choose better. But perfectionism has very, very, very many different ways of being represented in different people. Mm. Mm. Um mm. There are other things that I want to unpack about perfectionism. I'm going to use the word perfectionism to actually, as an umbrella term, to represent both perfectionism and control. I think perfectionism right. is universally more understandable than control. People have different connotations to how they perceive control. But mm. perfectionism is also a word that's more often used in a wellness space. And as I said, it's got more of a sympathetic connotation rather than control you know, we love to sort of say who's controlling us, but we don't necessarily want to um, admit it's... that we're controlling others. So mm -hmm. I'm going to use perfectionism as the umbrella term. But as I said, perfectionism and control are what I've distilled as the most toxic drivers behind, you know, you know the fuel in our fires. There's yeah. three types of perfectionism. So there's self-orientated perfectionism, which is obviously the standards to which you hold yourself, reasonable or unreasonable. There's socially prescribed perfectionism. So that which sort of society imposes on us, our tribe, and even the globe at large, you know, what we see, the standards that we strive to based on that which we see on the internet. And then the perfectionism standards that we impose on others. So whether it's our spouses, our children, our colleagues, grandchildren, or any other interpersonal relationship that we hold. So self-orientated, mm -hmm. socially prescribed, and this perfectionism that we impose on others. I think the shortest, most relevant way that I can describe perfectionis perfectionism is, is that it's an internal conflict. And that yes. internal conflict exists when your actual self and your idealized self aren't in an alignment. Or your actual life and your ideal life aren't in, al in alignment. So it's an internal mm -hmm. conflict between actual self and ideal, ideal self. Or not really ideal mm -hmm. self because... But idealized, perceived, you know, mm. see, mm. well, it's sort of the idea, I guess, that who I am is not good enough. So who I should be should be better. Sure. On the perfectionism thing, one of my favorite quotes, and I think a lot of people have bumped into it already, is expectation is the thief of joy. And that describes that internal conflict so well. Um, yes. If you have a preconceived idea of what life should be or what you should be, you cannot experience anything as joyful because you will always fall just a little bit short because nothing is ever good enough. Yeah. Ego. Even when you achieve it, you're happy for five seconds, five nanoseconds. And then the ego goes, oh, but did you see so yeah. and so, you know, did it so very much better? Yeah. And then all of a sudden you've got a new to-do yeah. list. So, um, yeah, expectation is the heap of joy and that internal struggle that exists that trademarks perfectionism. Yeah is such a good representation or so well representation in, represented in that quote. Yeah. So Nikki, from I think the studies that have been conducted into perfectionism, um, something that I think is relevant to share with listeners, and it's especially relevant at the moment because of our, I almost want to say, our uncontrolled usage of social media the most damaging perfectionism is actually socially prescribed perfectionism. Sure. So, you know, in terms of 
I think in terms of, I almost want to say standards that you'll never be able to achieve um, because we all know how much fakeness exists on social media. That socially prescribed perfection is really eroding people. Um, yeah. And then, so as I said, perfectionism control, you know, the drivers of, or the most toxic fuel that I observe um, as, yeah, in, in practice. So just curious, before we go a little bit further, where have you personally experienced perfectionism and where did it really, where, where was your aha moment there? Um, I think, let me just, sure, Nikki, I think it's been a theme in my life forever. Hmm. I'll tell you yeah. where, where my biggest awareness of it was, was when I qualified out of university I can't believe how much of a boost having an answer for when someone asks you what it is that you do, having the answer of physiotherapy, you know. So I realized that it's actually not even at the top of the food chain in the healthcare system. But once I qualified and Stellenbosch University set me free with that title, if someone asked me what I did, physiotherapist. And I couldn't believe how much of a pseudo boost that university degree gave me. But then it wore off within six months. And then I was like, "Uh oh, what now? And then I was like, now I'm going to have to, what do I, then I played with the idea. Listen, it's an idea that I played with quite often, but um, I thought maybe I must go and study medicine. You know, maybe that's what my next thing must be. And then I worked for two years as a physiotherapist and then I, the opportunity came up to start my own practice. And then I had another boost. And then I was like, Ooh, now I'm not just a physiotherapist. I'm a very young physiotherapist and I've got my own yep. practice and I don't have my own practice anywhere. I've got my own practice in Bryanston. And coincidentally, a lot of the people that I was associated with in that practice were very prestigious. I, I actually had massive imposter syndrome because I was like, what wow. am I doing with the likes of these people all at the top of their, you know, sort of game. They were much older than I was. They pioneered so much in their field. And here I am just a sort of bright eyed, bushy tailed little physiotherapist. And I get to sit around the table with them. But that gave me another boost. Wow. I always say life yeah. is all. Life is very kind because every single time I've thought, man, I'm cute. Life cuts me down to size. But oh, that, I, that was sort of <laughs> exposure. Yes, that was that was exposure to me to where I realized sort of it's not necessarily perfectionism, but it was attaching my sense of self-worth to a title or to an outcome or to an achievement. I've always held myself okay. to very high standards. Um And it's the reason, you know, I sort of believe it's the reason why I've been successful, but it's also been the reason why I suffer the most. So I'm acutely aware of, you know, sort of when I realize that the fuel behind my fire is now hurting me rather than enhancing me. So, yeah, but I think that that was, yeah, that was where that represented the most, you know, that sort of, oh, I've arrived and then life knocks you down or yeah. that feeling wears off and you're like, oh, what am I going to do next? That's amazing. That gives me that boost again to give me yes. the confidence to walk into a room, you know, uh, I don't know, and ho- hold, hold yeah. my head high. I think it was Tim Ferriss who said that perfectionism is the only sociable, acceptable form of self-sabotage or something to that effect. And I think, well, that really resonated for me because it is so self-sabotaging. And that's why I used the word perfectionism, but I did want to add the caveat that we so often revere it. You know, yes. we all say, oh, shame, you're a perfectionist. But secretly, if you are a boss and you're conducting an interview and someone says that to you, you're like, great, mm. keep up that standard, sure. you know. Or um, if you think of your teenage daughter, you're like, well, her perfectionism at least makes her not be overweight, you know, and she's got so many overweight friends. So we don't care that it's the fact that she, you know, whatever, she hates herself and hates her life, but socially it looks so nice. You know, she looks lovely on photos and I can show so, oh, so many, yeah, so many different things where perfection, we pretend to not like it, but we don't actually want, we want it to remain intact because we feel that protects us in society and to some yeah, degree and if 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 perfectionism is it's control of the self where control is control of the environment so let's dive into the, the flip side of the coin coin 100 percent. so i sort of played with the idea of sort of saying is perfectionism or is control perfectionism in a verb, uh, yes. you know, because that's actually how it manifests. So what you're trying to do is, is I'm trying to mitigate 
any variable in order to keep myself safe. And that I do, I do chat about that a little bit, but um, that the illusion of safety um, is what fuels perfectionism and control. Yes. It's this idea that I can make sure that I never suffer because I have mapped out the full parameters and anchored them down, you know, the parameters of my life. So it's an illusion of safety that actually, you know, sort of that's one of the root causes of perfectionism and control. And I think that's also where the socially imposed, not the socially imposed, the perfectionism tendencies that we impose on others, we tend to do that to our children specifically, and it yes. is born out of love, but we want to ultimately keep them safe. So you want to make sure that nothing can ever hurt that child as long as you're in control. So you sort of, you then give them your rule book. You say, if you do this and this and this and this and this, you'll never get hurt, you know? So if you're a certain weight and you play a certain sport and you achieve a certain goal, no one will bully sure. you. No one will tease you. No one will say that you can't be part of a team. You will make sure that you get a job, you know? You'll be a contributing member to society. So a lot of, a lot of I mean, or I think parenting is one of those instances where that is Absolutely. so beautifully represented. We don't, we love this thing so much that we don't want it to suffer so we'll equip it with a rule book but it's actually your standards yes, that you're imposing yes. on that child. and the human brain is designed in a way that control and perfectionism and anxiety and fear is a feature not a defect so this is our wiring it takes an enormous amount of um you know conscious awareness to to go well this is my wiring but it's not how i want to live because it's causing the issues 100 percent. it's very dense because it is it is rooted in your survival yeah instincts so it's very dense and it's it's hardwired and it's it's um uh i almost want to say it's it's genetically sort of programmed for the survival yeah. of the species so that's the one thing it is also you know it's also transferred genetically yeah. and culturally you know so those belief systems are transferred via, you know, generation, 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 and then also every institution you pass through, you know, every um, church or culture or religion that you belong to, you know, all of these then reinforce it over time as well. So um, it is difficult. It's, diffi it's difficult to neutralize. Um, but just to tie into the rigidity thing, as I said, we are all looking for a silver bullet that is going to take away our problems permanently. Exactly. Patients will often come to me and then they'll sort of think that they failed because they're like, I thought I'd dealt with this. I thought I'd grown beyond this. Why yes. is this coming up again? I thought I'd stop. You never, you never go and live in a destination. And that, as I say, because that would just aggravate rigidity. Life isn't consistent. It exists on a continuum. Um, that which is healthy for you today could be very damaging tomorrow. So what you want to what you want to sort of do is is you want to remain steering the boat, but you don't want to try and control the ocean. Take care of the boat, and then the boat will withstand the storm. Right. You know, type of thing. Right. But everyone's focused on the ocean. Everyone's focused on the storm. Yeah. The things that are outside of ourselves that we want to control. Exactly now. that. So, so I think that that sort of alludes to what it is that I'm going to recommend today. It's not to. It's not to control the external world. It's how you maintain the integrity of the vessel that you were allocated so that you have the capacity to withstand the storm. So my recommendations are not rooted in rigidity. They're rooted in remaining pliable, remaining open, remaining soft, remaining available, allowing life to change you, to fix you, to wash over you, to transform you. Yeah, and the flexibility to realize when something isn't working and that actually maybe it should change. We And I just, you know, I can resonate change, so much 100. with what you're saying is where are we being flexible under the illusion that this is the way life works? Because actually there's no rule book. Works. Um, and there is no rule book. And I read a quote once that said, um, there's a theory that, you know, the the uni the complexities of the universe once dis or once understood change in an instant to remain, you know, sort of a mystery. So as soon as you figured it out, I actually, my brother said this best about parenting. I quoted so often. I asked him, he's got a four-year-old and I asked, how's parenting oh. going? He said, I feel like parenting is a combination lock 
and you spend all the time trying to figure out the combination lock and as soon as you have it it changes the code changes yes life is like that as well and that is to keep us curious to keep us engaged to keep us um self orientated you know so it's by divine yeah. design it's not some prank <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, this you know what what you've been saying is sort of rippling out into so many themes here and I know. yeah, you when you when we think about I mean just in your practice uh, when you you people come to you because they have got a locked shoulder or a neck pain and I mean the feel feeling that you get for where's the rigidity in this person's life and the conversations you have you know you're working the body but at the same time you're having a conversation with somebody and when you can mm-hmm. have this kind of conversation and start tweaking neuroplasticity so when we plant seeds you know it'll either it'll either take root or it won't take root because if it it's root, resonant definitely. it'll work if it's not resonant it's not applicable but the satisfaction mm. one gets by being part of somebody's growth process in oh. almost initiating a neuroplasticity that would otherwise never have taken root it must be the mo- it is I can't say mo- must be it is the most gratifying thing one can do um, in this industry to be part of that healing process. Yes, absolutely, and. Um... So there's a there is one specific thing that I want to address in this, but I'm going to do it when I do my recommendations for um you know for the listeners. But yeah. I'll tell a story about my own practice there as well. The only one thing that I wanted to say, you know, when people come to me and say, "Oh, thank you so much," you know, you helped me so much. I I I cannot. It's I'm not being humble when I say it. I'm not sort of. It's not humility that I'm when I sincerely say that it's the biggest privilege of my life. And um, yeah. I th- think, I think the the thing that's the biggest pri- privilege of my life, I believe, that, and it's a prerogative that doesn't exist only for healthcare practitioners. It's people are medicine, and it's an idea that I've been playing with the sort of for a while now because I help my patients with certain things. But if I tell you that the stories that they've shared with me, the energy that they've sta- shared with me, my patients are my medicine. Um, And it's a reciprocal thing. Obviously, the nature of my practice is it's a formal setting. I've got a plinth. Someone fills in a little yellow file. You know, they lie on the plinth. But you can go for a dinner and a friend heals you. You can be in a meeting and a colleague heals you. You can have an interaction with a cashier and they heal you. So people are medicine. And I think if people just realize that we're here, we're here to fix one another. your, Your life becomes, you know, it takes on a dimension that is just so satisfying. It is. No. It is a joy. And I think it's really missing in this day and age is understanding that we are actually here for each other and nothing else. Uh-huh. Really? 100%. One, I, oh man, one of my favorite quotes is, it's not what you get in life, it's what you give. And that, mm-hmm. whew, it, that's been the biggest transformation. And I, do, I definitely yeah. think it comes with maturity. It doesn't necessarily come with virtue I think it comes with maturity because I know that when I was younger, I was driven by ambition and I wanted to achieve and I wanted to make my mark on the world. But now I'm there where I'm like, man, if I change, if I just touch one person, it's one person that's load is a little bit lighter, you know. And that, as I say, just came with maturity. It just came with my own getting out of my own head, you know, stop being so self-involved. Um, yeah, so it's, I, I profess to be particularly virtuous in it. It's just a capacity that I've developed as I became older. Yeah. And, and yeah, life, life teach, it takes you down that road, but, um, you clearly not doing a job, you, you following a calling and that's, this is the joy that comes with the calling. And that on that note, though, Nikki, because I'm just going to add this because people might listen to my story and then immediately feel hollow because their job doesn't satisfy them in the same way. A job is ratios. Not a hundred percent of my job is nice, yeah. but if if I can sort of look at it and go seventy thirty, you know, that's what's satisfying. Absolutely. And I don't think that I was preordained to be a physio. As a series of choices, it led me down this yeah. path. I could have found exactly the same satisfaction in terms of problem solving, whether I was an engineer, an accountant, or a street sweeper. Yeah. It wouldn't matter. So I want to just not. Let anyone listen to this talk because I speak of what I do with absolute passion, but I don't want it to someone to kind of go, oh, Laurel's job sounds so much nicer than my yeah. job. It does, the job is irrelevant. Yeah. You have to 
find meaning in the job, you know, because if you just keep thinking, oh, it would be so much, I've got so many patients that are in corporate that go, I wish I could just do a job that's more meaningful. When you go with the idea of people heal people, you can heal people at a board yeah. meeting, you can heal people when you're dealing with their tech, you can heal. So those are clinical settings, but there's still opportunity for connection, there's opportunity for purpose, there's opportunity for meaning, no matter what the job. Anyway, I just wanted to add that. Well. Yeah, every interaction is an opportunity to help someone have a better day. And it, it gets paid Absolutely. forward exponentially. 100%. And I think, I think what I also want to invite listeners on that topic to do is to not then go, oh, well, now I'm going to take what Laurel said, what Laurel and Nikki discussed, and I'm going to seek opportunity to help people. You don't have to seek opportunity. You miss opportunity if you're seeking opportunity. Mm. But if you go and listen with intention or right. you just say a prayer and say, I'm available, use me then the opportunities will arise. You don't have to, it's not an active seeking opportunity for connection because when you actively pursue it that way, you tend to not find it, you know. Yeah. But if you kind of, as I say, if you say it in the format of a prayer of universe, I'm available, please use me. I promise you it will It will give you the opportunity of, you know, it, it'll highlight um, where you can make a change. Oh, completely. Don't look too hard. It's everywhere. Just the soft focus yes, is what enables everywhere. this thing to, to happen. So what are those recommendations just based on this first pillar? Because yes, we're gonna okay. we're gonna do three of these interviews just to get through these these podcasts, just to get through the enormity of this topic of finding the, a fire. Of the subject matter. Of Absolutely, the subject matter. yes. Um, Nikki, the one thing that I, before I introduce what my recommendations are, I think the most relevant question is how do I know if my habits are causing me damage? Because mm. some people might be aware of it. Some people might sort of say, well, I did all the right things and, um, I'm not seeing the results, but some people will just relentlessly pursue on autopilot that which they've heard to be good and be blissfully unaware of the fact that they're taking I almost want to say all the remedies for burnout and funneling it through the same nervous system that led them to have burnout in the first place. Yeah. So I think the first thing that I need to equip listeners with is a self-assessment tool of whether your habits might be damaging you. So I've got three points to make there. The first clue um, as to whether your habit might be damaging you is if it's your entry point into a conversation or you try to manipulate conversation to to take it or to, to manipulate conversation in that direction. So okay. it's, hi, I'm Laurel and I'm vegan. Hi, um. I'm Laurel and I do it, you know. So it can be your veganism. It can be your CrossFit. Mm. It can be your job title. Mm. And it can be other things that you define your identity by. It can be the fact that, oh, I'm Laurel and I've got two under two you know or I have an autistic child or mm. I'm suffering an autoimmune condition when it's your first entry point into conversation or you manipulate conversation to take it in that direction there's probably something there that you need to pay attention to Agreed. so that's my first you know sort of first assessment tool to see whether something that you're doing might be damaging you the second clue and it actually stands in absolute opposition to the first one is is that you're unable to tell anyone about it Right. You have a bottle of vodka in your toilet cistern or you've got chocolate wrappers behind your headboard. Yep. So you can't tell someone what is in your pre-workout mix or you can't <sighs> admit the amount of kilometers that you ran when you were pregnant and then, you know, sort of Ooh. you wonder why, why your child was born prematurely, that yeah. sort of thing. So it's an opposition to you might manipulate conversation to make it the first topic that you discuss or you dodge all questions and you can't discuss it with people that actually love you. So those are two clues that your habits might be damaging you. Wow. And the third the third clue, and this is why this topic was born out of the rigidity pillar in my practice, is that you suffer emotionally if you can't achieve that habit every single day, week in and week out. Or if, you know, life sort of throws you a curveball, there's a meeting that comes up or you need to fetch a friend from the airport or, you know, they sort of reschedule your kid's hockey match and all of a sudden you're fuming because it's interfered with your habit. Yes. So things that should actually give you the opportunity for connection and joy, like watching your kid play sport or fetching a friend from the airport, all of a sudden you're resentful because yeah. it's interfered with this habit. Right. Now, obviously... You don't want life to interfere with good habits all the time because, I mean, I can dream up a thousand reasons why I shouldn't exercise, you know. Yep. Oh, look, there's a cloud out. <laughs> Go for a run, you know. I always say never underestimate the capacity to believe your own um, 
nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> I have stronger <laughs> words that I say I'll stick to nonsense. <laughs> but um yes, if you become emotionally very agitated, if something interferes with that habit, that's also yeah. a clue that um it's possibly damaging you. So the one thing that I wanted to add here, um, specifically because of the functional and integrative nature of my practice, and we we're looking at root cause. I've now introduced the idea that perfectionism and control are the most common toxic fuels um, that I observe that fuel fire. But at the heart of perfectionism and control actually lies um, evidence in our relationship with change. So you and I did touch on these, you know, on this topic, but yeah. perfectionism and control isn't, it's still not actually at the root. Your relationship with change is at the root. Mm. And Control and perfectionism are an attempt to mitigate the variables in the ever-changing nature of the world. So as I said, it's that it's that attempt to ensure your safety by making sure that you anchor down every aspect of your life so that you can't be surprised or that you can't be caught off guard. So for the sake of today's talk, I don't want to go too deeply into our relationship with change and why it's damaged because it's going to quickly go into a how to heal your nervous system talk and a mental health talk. And that's not what it is that I want to suggest here. But rather what I'm suggesting is remain or maintaining a pliable approach to health will ensure better wellness. So the pliability does reside in your nervous system. And um, the way that I want listeners Think of their nervous system. I always say your nervous system is a highway and the comfort of driving on that highway depends on two things. It depends on the number of cars on the highway and how yeah. wide the lanes are and whether they're potholes. So it, the, what I always use is anyone driving in Joburg, yes. does your highway look like a Lulee's or is it a country lane? And the integrity of the highway and the, the, the comfort of your highway, as I say, depends on yeah. how pliable and how flexible your nervous system is. I'm not going to discuss that. That can be a separate topic if we, you know, if we so choose. But perfectionism and control are, it's actually about your relationship with change. And those are two toxic fuels that we implement to try and keep ourselves safe. So that's just something that I wanted to tie in for the functional and integrative approach. If I'm preaching root cause perfectionism and control aren't root cause but they're definitely symptoms of a root cause that's your relationship with change okay so i think getting we've discussed so much but getting to the meat of the you know of the podcast the actual message that i want listeners to take home is what it is that i recommend okay so the first thing that i recommend when you want to make sure that the the fuel that is what's fueling your fire is positive and um, doesn't tie into the perfectionism and control um, narrative, you have to personalize your def definition of success. So as I said, I love stories. So I'm going to tell you a story once again about when I was at university. I was in my second year when Steve Jobs died. And I had an existential crisis on right. my, my varsity bed about his death because I, at that stage, my absolute measure sure. for success was fame and fortune. And there was Steve Jobs, all the money in the world, very well-known dude, and he was dead at 49. Yeah. And I, as I say, I had an existential crisis and I had to really, I, was, I, I took stock. I was like, I'm going to have to think about what it is, why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I recommend this to listeners as well. And I recommend it to patients is that you have to personalize your definition of success. I think society, it's very easy to take on society's standards of success and they tend to be more commercial. So Fame and fortune ties in with that commercial success. It's what your job title is and what your bank account looks like. But the vocabulary that I suggest for listeners here is to think of your measure of success in your CV versus your obituary. Commercial say, success, you know, is easy to feed into what's in your CV and your resume. So what have I achieved? Where have I worked? How much money have I made? What is my job title? How much regard do people have for me as a result of it? But your obituary is ties in more with wellness because your measure of success for your obituary will be um, who did I influence? Who did I connect with? You know, when people remember me, what will they think of? And I can promise you now they're not going to tell you what your one rep max deadlift is. <laughs> um, it will, it's not or your bank account or your title. And um, I think the one thing there as well um, to remember with sort of your obituary 
just back to the conversation that we had, it's actually about others and not so much about yourself. Your CV is very much about yourself. But I don't want to suggest that you eliminate your, yourself right. out of the thing because you are your primary responsibility. But think of your obituary success in terms of interpersonal connection. You know, did I go and have a slice of cake with a, a friend? You know, did I drink sundowners on a Friday afternoon? Those are also ha habits that you have to make space for that aren't necessarily all good, but make sure that you've got a very well-rounded definition of what success is. And that you, the other thing that I want to suggest here is, yeah. is that what your measure of success is will also change over time. Um, you, you know, so it'll, it'll differ in different stages of your life. Um, the one thing that I want to add about a measure of success as well is, is that if your objective of, uh, with a habit is to become better at the habit, you're missing the point. So we don't meditate to be better at meditation and we don't exercise to be better yeah. at exercise. We meditate to be ex better at life Love and it. we exercise to be able to partake in life and to show up in life. So yeah, that's sort of the first recommendation. Personalize your definition of success. And it's quite difficult um, to necessarily do that because sure. we can't help but be exposed to other people's success on a daily basis. But what I always suggest is, is that if commercial success was the key to happiness, and I'm not yes. speaking about, obviously there's a baseline of having just your basic needs met, you know, and that'll tie very much into commercial success. But it's been proven time and time again that at a certain point, more money doesn't make you happier. You know, at a yes. certain point, another title doesn't actually make you happier. We wouldn't see substance abuse in high earners. We wouldn't see suicide rates so high in people with absolute sort of accolade and that have achieved so well yeah. in their life. You know, if those things truly did bring us happiness, um, you know, that's not what that that wouldn't trademark the top. Mm -hmm. So my first recommendation is personalize your definition of success. My second recommendation is commit to the process and detach from the outcome. So committing to the process is part of living a deliberate life because a lot of people might say, oh, well, do you suggest that we're not deliberate about how we invest our energy? And that's absolutely not what I'm saying, because if you want, if you want yep. a satisfying life, you have to be deliberate about your 24 hours. So committing to the process is part of living a deliberate life and having grit to show up when you don't want yeah. to. But attaching to the outcome is rooted in perfectionism and control. And it's also tricky here. Uh, because what what might have sort of drawn you to the habit, you might have seen someone else on Instagram sort of saying, you know, I achieved yes. my ideal body when I hit my protein target, so I started resistance training, or, you know, meditation was what cured my insomnia or whatever. So what drew you to the habit might be someone's testimony of the success that yeah. they achieved. So allow them to signpost for you, but don't try and emulate their journey exactly. Don't say, but tell me exactly what you ate. Tell me exactly how many minutes you meditated for, because then there's too much of an attachment um, to the outcome. So what I suggest here is the fuel behind your habit needs to come from the idea that I'm, I'm going on this path to understand yeah. myself better or to take better right. care of myself rather yeah. than to change myself. So I do what I do as an yeah. act of self-love, not in not as an attempt to change who I am. So my second recommendation is commit to the process, but detach from the outcome because commitment to the process is part mm. of living a deliberate life, but detachment or attachment to outcome is rooted in perfectionism and control. And always do value. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So the third thing that I recommend is learn how to fail. <laughs> and yeah. um, I think the sooner people accept failure and mediocrity as a normal part of life, the less life hurts. So we've got a very yes. robust culture concerning the pursuing of your ambitions, but we've got a very less refined one concerning knowing when enough is enough and when to walk away. Mm. We mm. tend to revere tenacity and fortitude but it's also a virtue to know when to walk away from what's no longer yeah. serving you. Oh, it's a superpower. It is an absolute superpower to know when something's not working. Absolutely. And also to, and just to tie back to the previous recommendation, 
you know, you might bump into a habit. Someone got these absolutely fabulous results from it. You do exactly what they said that you must do and you don't. It might not be your, you know, it might not be your, your catalyst. Thing. It might not yeah. be It might not be your thing, you know. Yeah. So I'm married to someone who's an ultra endurance athlete and I'm quite uh -huh. a big um, sort of advocate of meditation. He's like, suffering is my meditation. That is what <laughs> I cannot get him to sit so long enough on a couch to meditate with me. He, he knows himself well enough to know that meditation isn't going to be, it's not going to be this aha moment for him that it was for me. Sure. On this That's learning okay. how to fail, Nikki, I want to sort of just tell a story from practice as well. It's a bit of a generic, well, not a generic one. It's um, one that I've bumped into so often. One of the most limiting questions that patients say to me in practice is why? Why did this happen to me? If I can just understand why, then I can move on. Mm. I truly believe that it's not our prerogative as humans to understand the full intricacies of the fiber that upholds the universe. If you have unanswered why, you can get stuck there because it's like a full stop. But why? What if you never know? So Carolyn Mace is someone who I follow quite closely and I enjoy. It's a limiting question. It is a limiting question. It's a full stop question. There's no, mm. there's no, there's no, there's nothing after that. Yeah. Carolyn Mace um, gave me quite a nice um, vocabulary for this. And her reply to this very question is, why not you? Yeah. And nice when you one. think of that, all of a sudden you're like, oh, oh okay, <laughs> snap out of your preciousness. Yeah. So I generally, you know, initially I've now adopted hers. I've adopted her reply to this question, but I used to just say to patients, what if the only answer is because now we have to do, we have to, you know, if we just sort of say, because this happened, then we can move on from there. But if you just st get stuck at why, um, you know, that will really limit your progress personally. Sure. I and put this under the learn how to fail, because I think yeah. it's very important for people to accept that sometimes tragic things happen in life that we have absolutely no understanding for. You just have to feel the grief. You have to suffer the magnitude of the loss. And, um, you know, you have to let it wash over you and transform you, but you have to accept that you won't necessarily understand why that all happened, you know. And, um, mm. yeah, so I've added this under learn how to fail. And the reason also why I've added this under learn how to fail is that every tragedy that hits you in your life, you do not have to use as fuel to catalyze into a success. Sometimes something just happens and it's tragic and you move on. You haven't failed at failing if you don't write a book about it, you know. So just accept that tragic things happen in life. The other relevant point that I've exactly. observed so blatantly in society today is, is that we live in a time of novelty seeking. Everyone mm. is busy seeking for novelty all the time and that we're missing the joy of the ordinary. So... Yeah. When I introduced this concept of learn how to fail, I said accept failure and mediocrity as a normal part of life. Mediocre, it doesn't necessarily have to be mediocre. It can just be ordinary. Become mm. fascinated with the ordinary. Become comfortable with the ordinary. So on the, you know, sort of on the... um on the analogy of what fuels your fire, novelty seeking demands a massive pile of wood all the time. It Ordinary does. is okay to take over with kindling. So mm. just like season, just like seasons have their own rhythm, so life also has its own own mm. rhythm. And sometimes mm. life demands a bonfire, but sometimes a candle will do. You know. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think there. As I say, I think one of the limiting factors in sort of achieving happiness in our habits is everyone being novelty seeking, seeking the extreme, having something that no one else has experienced before, wanting to share it on social media. On that topic, and it was, this is, this was a phrase that was given to me now, I call them heaven faxes, but on that topic of ordinary, something that I've observed in my own life is, is that the most incredible things that have happened to me, I can't take any credit for. It was pure luck or chance that made me be in the right place at the right time. It wasn't, I never all carefully orchestrated and yes. planned it. I just showed up and then all of a sudden, you know, I met an amazing person. That's how my practice started. That's all sorts of exciting things that have happened to me in my life. So what I want to offer as an alternative to being novelty seeking all the time 
is if you take responsibility for the ordinary, the divine orchestrates the extraordinary. I love that. But you must partake in the ordinary people life. I loved it too. I'm going to say it again because it was so beautiful and it's not my words. It was given to me. If you take responsibility for the ordinary, the divine orchestrates the extraordinary. If you keep busying yourself with trying to facilitate the extraordinary, you get nowhere. <laughs> so I almost laugh. I, it's the sort of paradoxical nature of God. Um, you know, stop trying to do my job on my behalf. It just that just speaks to so much, and it also speaks to trying to control the outcome all the time. It's one thing knowing where you're going, but trying to control for every, you know, pothole in the road Absolutely. on the way, you're going to just put up blocks. So. Yeah, take responsibility for the ordinary, but know your direction. Absolutely. But also trust that life changes your direction. My grandfather actually said to me once, well, he actually said it to my mom. I'm just relaying her story. He said that the biggest mistake that he made in his life is setting a goal, putting his head down, working super hard, looking up and seeing that the goal had shifted. Then he'd reorientate himself all over again yeah. and make sure that he was moving in the direction of the goal. I really, and that once again ties in with that, do the ordinary, do, show up for yourself, commit to your life, commit to the process, but let God decide where you're going. Right. And I say God, let's call him the divine, the universe, whatever term you're comfortable with, sure. but it is beyond the capacity of, um, or it's beyond the capacity of human to facilitate. There, There is divinity in our lives. So, yeah. Absolutely. So the fourth thing that I recommend is self-compassion. Um yeah. I think I think this is it's a pretty simple one but it's one that we fail at so much as I said because we've got a we've got a culture that a robust uh, sort of relationship with ambition but not so much with rest and restoration. So self-compassion, rest when you're tired. Rest is a virtue in a culture that glorifies exhaustion. And um yeah, I think just knowing when to stop. The other thing that I want to add about self-compassion as well and rest, uh, a very big sort of awareness that I had specifically in the ultra-endurance space, um, every now and then I dip my toe into it with along with my husband. I'm not sort of the athlete that he is, but I was curious about it because yeah. of the self-transformation self that I recognized in him. We did an, an event in Namibia, which was um, sort of, it was, I did 240 kilometers, which is a distance that I've done before, and it was much less elevation gain. And um, so I wasn't intimidated by the event. I mean, I knew it would be hard, but I wasn't that intimidated. And that event unlocked me in ways that I could never have predicted. But something that I learned on that event, yeah. it's definitely, Clinton has definitely signposted for me. The only option is not quitting. You're allowed to rest. So the yeah. ultra endurance events are quite nice because they give you a lot. Of, well, they give you a fair amount of time. And if you just keep moving forward, you'll get there. At some point, I just sort of would stop and you know, lie on the side of the road and then get back on wow. my bike. So I could have quit in the event. A lot of people did. But I, I just thought, okay, well, I'm going to be doing this for the next 24 hours. This is what I've committed to. Yeah. I might finish. I might not finish. But I'm going to keep moving forward. And when I'm tired, I'm going to stop. And then I'm going to replenish. And then I'm going to keep going again. Yeah. So you know, sort of self-compassion, definitely a virtue to know when to quit. But sometimes just resting also does the job and it gets you the, to the destination that you'd like to get, you know, it allows you to achieve the oh, destination yeah. that you set your um, eye on. The other thing that I want to recommend under this sort of um, self-compassion uh, heading is be comfortable with being good enough rather than being good or being great. Um, I think... You know, I think the the sort of quote that comes to mind is is that you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And choose the things that you really want to excel at, but be okay that it's going to come at the cost of just being mediocre at other things, you know. So, but also it's not mediocrity because as I say, mediocrity is such a charged word. It's just being good enough rather than being great. You can be a good enough parent because there's only 24 hours in a day. You're not going to be the Montessori parent necessarily every single day. And then under this as well, create space in your daily routine. Um, so I think that just ties in with a Take as much time as you need to get somewhere. You don't have to achieve it. It's not, you know, run your next marathon in six weeks or achieve your ideal weight in two weeks. Anything that promises that is usually flawed in any case. But um, create space in your daily routine 
so that you achieve some of the things, some of, or that you achieve most of the things, some of the time, you know, yeah. and that's sort of, that is a little bit of a gentler approach than, you know, exactly. sort of achieving all of the things all the time, because you're likely to not carry on. That's what you're pursuing. I think the next thing that I recommend is keep your identity pure. So something that I've observed on countless occasions in my own life and in the lives of patients is, is that life will challenge you on that which you try to anchor yourself in, which exists outside of yourself. And that can be a bank account, your job title, your role as a parent. You need to keep your identity pure. And that means not to attach your self-worth to that which you can do or that which you contribute or that which you achieve. Um, yeah. Because I, as I say, I almost want to write this down as a universal law that that which, that where you have placed your self worth that exists outside of yourself will be challenged, and it's almost a promise from life that it will take it away from you, at least for a period of time, until you find who you are beyond that. So my recommendation there is keep your identity pure, and it sp it ties into you know that way I said, does what gives you a clue that your habits are busy corroding you. If it's your point of con, you know, or if it's your point of introduction, hi, I'm Laurel and I'm the physio, or I'm so and so, you know, and this is who I hang out with, or this is who I work with, or I'm yes, right back to that. So my recommendation here is make sure that you're keeping your identity pure. Unfortunately, I find that catastrophe has to strike before people are able to do this. Yeah. I'll give a simple example that happened in my own practice when I was, I started my practice, I think when I was 24, 25, and it was really just gaining traction. And I fractured my shoulder. I fell off a horse. And I always joke about that incident um, that I was both humbled and liberated to know that people could survive without me. Because oh. I just had to phone everyone and say, so sorry, I can't come to work. And I was petrified. I was like, what if they're not there? What if they don't need me after the two months? What if they figure out that they can solve their problems on their own? And what if I'm redundant? But mm -hmm. life had to challenge me on that because I was just bordering on that arrogance of who I am and what it is that I do. And then that's why I say yeah. every single time I've thought I'm cute, life cuts me down to size. But yeah, that identity comes with time. It's, it, it takes a long time before you realize what that identity is. And for some people, it never arrives. Absolutely. And it's layered. There are other things that I do still anchor myself in. We'd all do it all the time, once again, to try and feel safe in an ever-changing world. Um, the one thing that I want to mm. add about that, Nikki, is, is that so 27 fractured my shoulder, 30 fractured my collarbone. And I had an existential crisis. I lay on the couch and I wow. was like, what? Are we here again? I was like, universe, I've learned these lessons. What are you trying? And the cheeky reply I got was, okay, well, yeah. if you've learned them, then apply them. So... I just had to phone everyone up and say, hi, guys, out of the practice for six weeks. And I just had to accept it with grace. Sure. So what I always say to patients, don't think that just because you've learned a lesson once that you're not going to be learning it again or that you won't be challenged on it again. And I just had to sort of accept that um, Joburg was going to have to live without me for a while. Yeah, very humbling, very humbling. V very humbling, 100%. The one thing that I want to speak about here with keep your identity pure is... I always speak to patients about self-love because people tend to have these existential crises because they think that they're only worthy of love for that yes. which they contribute to society. So this keep your identity pure is an idea that the universe needs you just for who you are and not what you do or what you contribute. So just for the fact that you're on this earth, mm. existence needs you. And that's often that's often an ointment for a wound of sure. do more, be exactly. better, give more, you know, and especially, especially, you know, the nice thing about both my collarbone fracture and my shoulder, I, the physio in me knew that they would heal, but there are things that people will yes. not heal from spinal cord injuries. Yeah. There's no coming out of that. You know, the loss of a loved one, there's no, there's no changing. There's certain tragedies that strike that you can't change and that, that are permanent, and then you have to kind of become comfortable with the fact, well, prior to my spinal cord injury, you know, I was this high flyer. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, I need someone to yeah. help me eat. And that is hard. But as I say, life will challenge you on the idea that you are worthy because of what you do and what you contribute. This is a challenge in self-love of you are worthy because you exist, not because of what you do. Nikki, I think I the reason why I questioned or I coined this phrase is as a you know what fuels your fire is because I really you know everyone has a light that they need to share with the world and you need you need you owe it to yourself to let that light shine bright you know and I love helping people 
let their lights shine bright, you know. So, um, yeah. Wow. So, Laurel, where can our listeners contact you should they need to come and get unstuck and start finding their fire? Um, if they want to contact me, I am available. Or I mean, I, my practice is listed on Facebook and on Instagram. I've got all the – it's Laurel Doman Physiotherapy. Um, my website is available as well. Now all my contact details are, and I'm based at Riverside Shopping Center in Bryanston. But we will continue this conversation very soon because there is so much more to go into. And also, I'd like to invite anyone listening, if and not if, but I know that this conversation is going to provoke a lot of feeling, thoughts, emotions, and sharing. And, you know, we don't do this often enough on podcasts. I'd like to invite people listening to share their their stories, their experiences, and where this resonates, because we are all about being there for each other. And the more that we can support each other through this journey called life, the better life's going to be for everybody. 100%, Nikki. And I, I love that. I really love that because the power, once again, as I said, of storytelling, when people just know someone else has been through what they're going through or they find a safe place to share their story, that in itself is healing. You know, that in itself is medicine. So I really, I really like that. Thanks again for joining me for yet another phenomenal conversation. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and leave a review. This helps to get the show out to a wider audience. And if you have any suggestions for future guests and topics, please send an email or leave a comment.